Thank you. Thank you, and welcome to Reno versus ACLU 15 years later. Has the era of government, media, and communications content regulation come to an end? Uh, we have a very good panel. Uh, I'm Robert Cannon. I'm with the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, beside me is Catherine Crump from the ACLU. Uh, we have Dan Isaac from Parents Television Council and uh, Jeff McIntyre from Children Now. And at the far end is Adam Thayer, from the, now from the Mercatus Center of George Mason University. Um, uh, this is going to be a very excellent panel. This is a subject that gets uh, me very excited. I started my career as a communications attorney uh, writing the legislative history of the Communications Decency Act, a law review article. Uh, if we get this thing right, uh, we empower children, uh, we make them uh, successful, that we give them digital literacy so that they can be online and take advantage of, of the great things that are online. Um, hopefully you all will ask lots of questions. When you do, please do ask questions and not statements. Uh, the other thing, because um, I think last Tuesday something happened. It wasn't related to IPv6, so I don't really understand it, but on Tuesday something happened that involved the FCC. I'm here as the moderator. I'm not a panelist, so uh, I'm not speaking for my agency. Um, okay. So I'm going to give a quick context uh, to this discussion. Uh, the quick context is that in 1995, the National Science <coughs> Foundation completed its privatization of uh, the NSF net and started the public internet as we know it. In that same year, Senator Exxon introduced the Communications Decency Act saying that we had to stop the barbarians at the gate. The Communications Decency Act would have done uh, simply two things. It would have criminalized indecent and obscene content on the internet. Well, obscene content, that's easy. Obscene content's always illegal. That wasn't really a problem. But this indecent content, what is that? And indecent content is usually judged by the local community standard. What's the local community standard on the internet, on a national internet, on a global internet? So this is a bit of a problem. Communications Decency Act was passed in 1996, uh, was immediately challenged by the person to my left, uh, and uh, was declared unconstitutional by the district court. There was an expedited review, so it went very quickly to the Supreme Court. Uh, and in 1997, the Supreme Court unanimously ruled that the CDA was unconstitutional. The Supreme, one of the important things here is, you know, nobody knew quite what to do with the internet. What, what should we consider it? How should we an analogize it? And one of the things that was rejected, one of the government arguments, was that it was broadcast TV. The Supreme Court said, no, no, each medium is its own unique medium. We're not going to say it's broadcast TV. We're not going to impose those rules on it. Again, the Supreme Court struggled with this idea of what the community was. Again, in this national or global internet, one of the comments that was said was, uh, do we bring the worldwide conversation on the internet down to the dialogue to the discussion of Disneyland. Um, they found that the Communications Decency Act was vague, overbroad, and not narrowly tailored. One of my favorite <coughs> quotes about the Communications Decency Act <coughs> came from the district court. The district court said, it is no exaggeration to conclude that the internet has achieved and continues to achieve the most participatory marketplace of mass speech that this country and indeed the world has ever seen. The plaintiffs in these actions correctly describe the dem democratizing effects of, the, of internet communications. Individual citizens of limited means can speak to a worldwide audience on issues of concern to them. Federalists and anti-federalists may debate the structure of their government nightly, but these debates occur in newsrooms or chat rooms rather than in pamphlets. Modern day Luthers still post their theses, but to electronic bulletin boards rather than doors of churches. More mundane, but from a constitutional perspective equally important, dialogue occurs between aspiring artists, French cooks, or dog lovers, or fly fishermen. The internet may fairly be regarded as a never-ending worldwide conversation. The government may not, through the CDA, interrupt that conversation. All right, so that's what we're here to talk about, a law that was declared unconstitutional 15 years ago. But in that time, and in one minute, a few things have happened. Uh, the big ones was in 1997, the Child Online Protection Act was passed. Uh, that was the idea of taking the CDA 
applying it to commercial websites. Uh, that was ruled unconstitutional after 10 years of litigation because internet filters are effective and internet filters are a least intrusive means of achieving the government interest. In 2001, we had the Children Internet Protection Act. Uh, the ACLU again sued on that one. That was um, E-rate funding. E-rate funding, which the FCC uh, is in charge of. Um, if schools and libraries receive E-rate funding to support their technology, they have to have an online communications policy. This would be decided by the local community. It would not be decided by the FCC. It was challenged, and the court said, yes, as a condition, as a condition to a federal grant, the federal government can say what, they're, what you're going to do with your money. Uh, and then some of the lesser ones, Section 30, Section 230, which was part of the Communications Decency Act, Section 230 said that uh, online services are protected from liability when they take actions to protect children. That's still in place. COPPA and the Tax Moratorium Act required that ISPs provide notification to subscribers of the avail availability of filtering software. Uh, the Child Protection and Sexual Predator Punishment Act of 1998 requires ISPs to report known instances of child pornography. The Doc Kids Implementation and Efficient Efficiency Act of 2002 uh, created a separate domain space for kid-friendly web pages, .kids.us. The Can Spam Act requires labels for adult content. The Truth and Domain Names Act of 2003 uh, made it criminal to use domain names to trick people into seeing obscenity or children into seeing content harmful to minors. The Adam Walsh Act uh, created uh, online internet access to state sex offender registries. The Kids Act of 2008 uh, was a bill that uh, sex offenders, their online I uh, IDs that had to go into the registry. Uh, and then finally, we have the Broadband Data Improvement Act, which had so many provisions, I can't go over them, and required so many reports, I can't go over all the reports. Ah, yes, reports. Uh, all of these laws required reports. They're very, very good. I recommend them. I'm not going to go over them. If you want a list of all these reports, I'll give them to you. Um, so that's a brief history of 15 years and all the legislation that we've seen. Uh, and I haven't touched the communi other communication <coughs> mediums, like that strange box that has the rabbit ears on top of it that some people use to uh, watch video. I use it to watch internet video. Um, so, 15 years later, what's happened? Uh, it's, it's, it's really been, uh, you know, Reno versus ACLU was uh, uh, a, a tremendous piece of, of Supreme Court uh, case law, it's really influenced uh, First Amendment uh, uh, jurisprudence since that time, uh, and I thought I'd toss the ball first to the, to the only named party uh, here on the panel uh, and let Catherine talk about what the impact, the, the jurisprudence has been uh, of that case. Sure. Well, um, you know, the ACLU is a named party. I have to confess I wasn't there at the time. I was a high school student. <laughs> um, but uh, it really is foundational to everything the ACLU has done, um, the, and that has happened in the in the First Amendment area as concerns the internet. Um, I really love the quote you read from the district court because it captures this era, which I think in some ways has vanished. And um, I like to remember when all of this actually seemed miraculous. Now we go to the internet and we associate it with the annoying quantity of email we all receive, but it really was miraculous at the beginning to be able to view content from all over the world. Um, my favorite anecdote that the people who were at the ACLU at, at this time when the case was filed um, was we had one internet connection at the ACLU back in 1995. Um, there was one computer you could use to access the internet, and Chris Hansen, who was integrally involved in that case, looked over the shoulder of a young lawyer who was using it and noticed that the young lawyer was on the website of the British Museum and he said, my God, the long distance charges that we're going to rack up if you're just sitting here looking at the British Museum because it really was a learning process we all had to go through um, in order to understand what the internet was, was, was like and what its potential really was. Um, you know, and, and this key significance of ACLU v. Reno really was that it decided that the internet is more like a book than a television. 
um, which at that time wasn't uh, intuitive, especially since how do you view the internet? It's on a screen. Um, and that holding that the Supreme Court made um, that the highest form of review, the most strict form of review, applies to restrictions on speech on the internet um, really set the stage for all of our subsequent litigation. And I should add that although the ACLU was, was the lead party there, many other organizations and individuals were also involved in that early case. Jeff, do you want to go next? Um, I think the only thing that I would be able to kind of add to that is, is as we talk about kind of the zeitgeist of the start of uh, the Internet at that time, to think about what else was kind of going on in our nation, in our world. When we talk about 95, 96, 97 in that time, we're also talking about the 96 Telecom Act that came out that also mandated V-chips and all the television sets. A year later, we had the shootings in, uh, <clears throat> in Columbine, um, preceded by the shootings in Paducah and Springfield. Um, the Surgeon General had recently come out with a report on, uh, on violence, specifically highlighting the effects of uh, exposure to media on children. And so there was uh, suddenly this kind of this new move of, of legitimization, if you will, of uh, the effects of media that we were confronted with, with truly this kind of revolutionary moment where we found um, uh, media that we were kind of trying to struggle to define. Um, that uh, it wasn't a book, it wasn't a television, it was interactive. We knew that there was a certain amount of effect of, uh, uh, on children by kind of passive entertainment, uh, by being able to sit and watch, but when you took it to the next level of interaction, it raised uh, a ton of really, to me, legitimate research questions um, that we're still following through on, um, for good and for bad, how it can be used in interactive, uh, in educational uh, uh, settings, and we're seeing that now with uh, the use of things like smart boards, but also what are possible negative repercussions to it as well. And so for us at the time with CDA, um, when it came out and kind of went down, um, uh, it, it, was, it was almost like we could kind of, uh, from the children's advocates' perspective, we could kind of move it off the shelf for the moment and then go on to begin to focus on other issues, begin to take a look at the research, begin to see if there was stuff that needed to be funded in terms of research for this very new medium. <clears throat> and I think that it actually laid the foundation. One of the things that you uh, 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 excluded in the, in the rundown of the, uh, uh, there's so much that's out there. Yeah. Uh, focuses on what some of the real concerns are. It's not just kind of the vague, um, uh, uh, indecent stuff that's out there, but it really goes after something definitive that we can grab onto and that uh, allows federal agencies to be able to take a look at more concretely. Researchers can track it, advocates can get behind it. Um, and uh, yeah, and I'll stop with that. And so I, I would encourage you to kind of remember kind of the, the moment that we were at right there was a really intense moment in American culture and in American media culture, not just with CDA, but also with, uh, with the shootings and the argument about what was going on, the VCHEP, Telecom Act, et cetera. Uh, just very quickly, as, as is often the case uh, in my line of work, uh, Jeff said everything that I was going to say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I will throw out just sort of in a, in a general sense, uh, there, there are really two things that are at stake here. One is, um, you know, without uh, re-litigating the pros and cons of the original Reno decision, I, I would have some issues with it personally. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the broader question is, you know, in, to, if I may be permitted a more political cliche here, is are we better off than we were 15 years ago? Uh, particularly, are our children better off than they were 15 years ago? Uh, I read a statistic just last week uh, that uh, roughly 65% of all divorces now uh, have some sort of uh, online pornographic component to them. Uh, you know, people would argue that, that this has a foundational effect uh, on the entire society when uh, the, the numbers are that high uh, because this the content that we all uh, know is out there is so readily available. You know, what are the long-term consequences of that? And in that case, you know, we're talking about adults who supposedly have a better uh, uh, filter to be able to deal with things like that. So, so I would look at it sort of holistically in terms of uh, are all of these things trending in the right direction uh, that we'd all like to see uh, in terms of the protection of our children from these things. Uh, and secondly, 
is that uh, even with uh, you know the unanimous decision in, in Reno versus uh, ACLU, there's been you know all of these dozens and dozens of other further legislative uh, efforts at trying to wrap our arms around that problem. You know that's not a problem that has gone away as a result of this case. Uh, it's a problem that uh, at, at least. in the post-Pacifica era, a lot of FCC harassment of Howard Stern and radio, and radio had, of course, its own standards, sort of different from music and albums. Then we had video games really uh, capture the public imagination, and certainly Congress's, with games like uh, Mortal Kombat, things like this, concerns about violence in games, and the question of how we were going to deal with that. And then came the internet, and a lot of calls for regulating content on the internet. The important thing about these case studies, these episodes, is that each of these mediums were treated slightly differently under the First Amendment. And along came Reno and did something quite amazing, because it said essentially that this new thing called the net was going to be born free. And to use a phrase from my, uh, my good friend and mentor, Bob Corn Revere, the First Amendment lawyer, we were not going to allow the internet to sort of be raised in a First Amendment captivity, uh, where essentially it had a different standard or a unique standard based on its nature or the nature of the speech or uh, the technology that flowed over this medium. And that was really essential because it said speech is speech and we're going to treat this with the very strictest of scrutiny under the eyes of the First Amendment. And it established a new baseline, one that many of us believe should have always been in the books. The idea that the First Amendment has many flavors of scrutiny is in vogue in a lot of law schools still today. But the reality is, is that in some of our eyes, there's only one sort of scrutiny under the First Amendment, and that's strict. And Reno brought us back to that standard. It brought us back to a very high standard of First Amendment scrutiny that basically held the government to a much higher <coughs> bar when it tried to intervene and regulate content. And specifically what it said, that I think is the most essential takeaway from Reno, is that it said the burden on adult speech is unacceptable if less restrictive alternatives would be at least as effective in achieving the same goal. What this means is that empowerment was to, from there on out, trump censorship. And that standard is still with us today. And we've been holding the line in the courts since then with this standard, and I think quite rightly so. I think that's the right standard for a free society. That when you have the tools and the methods, as a parent or a household, to deal with content that comes in your home, no matter how objectionable or offensive you may find it, then the law must yield to those less restrictive means as opposed to playing the role of in loco parentis and guarding, guarding our children for us. That's a job for the parent and for families to decide on their own. I, I'd really like to pick up on that point, and we basically we jump straight to uh, COPA, COPA, Children Online Protection Act. Uh, the Supreme Court and the Children Online Protection Act, uh, if you didn't follow it, you're very fortunate. Ten years of litigation. Um, but basically it comes down to the holding that, you know, COPPA required uh, the COPPA Commission, COPPA Commission did a full review of the technology available in the market, it says that the, the technology, parental empowerment tools, uh, the technology available in the market, it's very competitive market, these are effective tools, uh, and they're available to parents. Uh, and the Supreme Court says on the one hand, uh, Use of those tools is the least restrictive means. Uh, instead of the court imposing this rule, uh, those parental control technologies are available. But also, uh, uh, Jeff, on, on what you were saying, uh, these parental control tools are effective in uh, attending to parents' concerns in the way that government law can't. Government you know, is directed at indecency and obscenity where you know, these tools, they can block violence or they can block uh, hate speech or racism uh, if the parent wants to. Why don't you go ahead and start? You look like you're, well, you look like you stepped up to the microphone. <laughs> yeah, I'm stepping up to this. Um, I disagree with that. Okay. Um, I think, uh, you know, and I'll do deference to the, the many great selections that we have 
uh, uh, tools of empowerment, as, uh, as Adam uh, rightly says, for parents to be able to use to make healthier decisions for their children. I think when we saw the real boom in that happen was actually right after the V-chip. And people kind of realized, hey, there's a market opportunity here. And so and, uh, my impression is that the V-chip actually established kind of this, this uh, uh, floor by which then the market could excel from that point. And when we begin to talk about the market, um, I, it, that becomes a little difficult for me because it seems to me that that it, it seems to me that that to, uh, uh, again to Adam's point on how uh, the, it was interpreted narrowly targeted was interpreted. I don't think that was actually in terms of empowerment. I think it actually meant you have to be more narrow in your target. And we found that with the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, that when we went from online protection to online privacy protection, we did that. We more narrowly targeted what was going to go on. Um, I think when you talk about relying on the market, I'm a little scared about that because ultimately, ultimately we're talking about the internet. We, we uh, Dan and I have talked a little bit about television. Adam's brought radio into this. We're talking about media in general. And if you talk about what are the tools that are out there that parents can use, well, we're relying on the marketplace then to be able to provide a basic foundation for our children. And what we find is that most of the parents, that most of the families that use this are going to be the parents that are going to be more technologically savvy, the parents that are going to be able to have more media options for their children in their houses. And so that means, in terms of establishing protections, this essentially, media and kids, this essentially becomes a poor kids issue. And so where we have places where uh, families are relying on the television to use as a safe play space, where the television or the internet is their place where they can prevent their kids from going out into the neighborhood and getting shot, or where they may rely on them for a variety of other, uh, other services, um, they're not going to have the means to be able to investigate into all the random options that may be out there, as, as great as they may be. And so in, uh, our impression is that, yeah, absolutely we rely on on the government to be able to step in and to, to establish kind of a bare minimum. I think the best place that that's kind of uh, obvious right now is when we take a look at the, uh, uh, the effect and the role of unhealthy food marketing on children. And when you see the relationship between unhealthy food marketing and specifically the relationship between media consumption and you look at it based on socioeconomic status and you compare that with where you have your highest rates of childhood obesity, Hey, look at that. It's in your poorest neighborhoods. It's in South Central Los Angeles and it's in the Bronx. It's with uh, young Latino males and with um, African American females, with the places where the socioeconomic status has been most greatly influenced on that. And so I'm, I, you know, I don't want this to come across as anti-market by any means because I think that, that what we did with the Telecom Act is that we did establish this floor by which the market could flourish, and that was a great thing. The entire organizations, like I see Galermi in the back, Common Sense Media, I don't even think was around at that time, and so uh, they are now a great presence on the scene for that. But then to say that we should solely rely on common sense media to solve all of our problems in this area and the marketplace around that, I think, would be uh, unjust. I'll briefly comment on that if I can. Um, the, Jeff sort of uh, seems to be giving up, I think, a bit too easily on the idea of education and empowerment being the, the a better approach to uh, dealing with some of these concerns, which are very legitimate concerns and that parents like myself struggle with every day because of the, uh, the onslaught of information that uh, our kids are exposed to. But the, the reality is, is that these empowerment and educational approaches, as the court has found again and again since Reno, need not be perfect to be preferable to government control or regulation or censorship. The reality is, is that censorship is a very clunky uh, tool that sort of takes a sledgehammer approach to these issues. Um, uh, I'd love to hear how Jeff or Dan would define indecency if we do want to regulate these things. Uh, this is a very challenging thing. Um, I, I don't think our government would be well prepared, just as we're finding out right now as it fights things like copyright piracy in the SOPA mm -hmm. context. I don't think it would be well prepared to start going out there and shutting down every internet site that was supposedly indecent. And I think we have to talk about the mechanisms of control and ask ourselves if we're better off relying on education and empowerment as the first line of defense and ultimately probably the more constitutional and First Amendment uh, enhancing approach to this issue. May I jump in? Don't mind. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it's an issue of, of trade-offs. So to complete the story, after the Communications Decency Act was struck down, Congress came back and enacted the Child Online Protection Act. 
And it was a more narrowly targeted statute than the Communications Decency Act, but it was still a burdensome and the courts ultimately ruled on constitutional statute. Just to remind everyone, it prohibited putting content that was harmful to minors online. Um, the definition of what constituted harmful to minors was um, not easy to apply and understand. It did try to create a safe haven, however. It said that if you used some sort of technological mechanism that could prevent minors from being able to access that content, that you would be protected. The unfortunate thing, is we, uh, however, was that um, those mechanisms simply didn't exist or didn't work very well. Um, and so this law um, was extremely broad and threatened a lot of valuable speech. Our clients in that particular case, and I was at the ACLU by the time, this case was back in the trial court in, in, in 2006. Uh, you can see how long this, this uh, piece of legislation was being litigated over. Our clients in, included uh, Salon.com, a well-known online magazine, uh, <coughs> who the court found legitimately could fear prosecution under the law because they had photos, the Abu Ghraib prisoner photos, those horrible naked men in pyramid photos up on their website. It included the Philadelphia Gay News. Um, whose personal ads uh, targeted uh, you know, same-sex same -sex relationships. It included a broad range of speech. So this was yet another example of a clunky internet censorship uh, statute uh, that, that ultimately uh, was going to create a lot more harm, harm than good. Um, and parents, of course, had these other tools available to them. You want to jump Sure. Uh, just, just a couple of quick things. Uh, you know, it's as, as much as Adam would love to live in the world where uh, a strict scrutiny applies to everything, that's not the world we live in, at least not yet. Uh, so, you know, in, in terms of the definition of indecency, there's a time-tested one on the on the broadcast medium, uh, and and nobody is is legitimately arguing that we should apply that test to the online world. Uh, the the question is, in lieu of that, uh, in lieu of that, uh, as uh, Jeff eloquently put it, that sort of uh, uh, basement in terms of, uh, you know, the, the bar can't be lowered farther than this, you know, what do we do uh, in the online space on that? And that's you know, obviously a, a much more uh, complicated question. Uh, what's important to keep in mind, though, is that, uh, you know, as, as exciting as the Internet is, and as much content is out there, and as much as we all, uh, you know, even the folks in, in the room today are, are you know, uh, twiddling on their wireless devices as discussing this particular uh, issue, and I probably would be if I were out there as well, um, you know, the, the dominant form of media remains uh, 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 television and broadcast television in particular. And the reason for that is, is really twofold. One is that it has much more history than these other forms of media do. Uh, and second is that it's uh, much more broadly available and much more ubiquitous than these other things. Uh, that's not to say that other forms of media are not g gaining ubiquity all the time. Uh, but in the real world, uh, outside of the Washington, D.C. Uh, policy wonk area, uh, that is the dominant form of media. That's where we can find our kids day in and day out. Uh, so, so there are some rules that are set up for that, and uh, uh, the, the 96 Telecom Act tried to set up some rules for that. Uh, I would, uh, I'd argue that uh, that, that, at least in terms of uh, how the V-chip and the parental controls and things like that have been uh, implemented, has been an abject failure uh, on a number of different levels. I'm, I'm sure we'll, we may be able to get to that as well, but, uh, uh, but it did at least uh, set out the territory that said, Okay, we're going to have a free market here, but the free market has an obligation uh, to uh, to uh, give parents the empowerment tools that they need to, to do a good job to protect their own kids. I I would say that um, I don't think this is a choice between education and censorship, um, uh, and I I don't think it's uh, uh, helps us in the debate um, uh, by saying that we think that there is uh, uh, feasible restrictions that can be uh, placed to be able to help kind of guide the marketplace here is not to be anti-education. It's actually in order to be able to encourage the marketplace to go in more healthy sort of decisions. Um, I think uh, uh, I'm, I'm, with yesterday's holiday, I've got Martin Luther King on my mind, and one of his quotes was that, um, you know, you cannot uh, legislate morality, but you can regulate behavior. And so what we hope to do is not to be able to legislate uh, 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 the people that are, are, are wanting, <coughs> legislate morality into people's hearts, but we can restrict the heartless. And when we take a look at this conversation, it's so easy, especially in these sort of conferences, to get kind of these stars in our eyes talking about the technology, talking about the process. 
Um, I really like these panels because to me it shows that what we have is a problem that is still out there and that there are imperfect solutions that we have run up against that have been justifiably overturned. You know, I'm, I might have some, some small things to nitpick about the Reno decision, but it was overturned and we can move on and move to the, the next thing. Same thing with indecency. Um, from uh, the amicus that we supplied for uh, uh, the uh, Fox uh, case last week, uh, we argued on the side of the uh, side of the industry. My argument would be that that um, uh, indecency is a really, frankly, goofy law. It's really not very well uh, uh, established. It's not very well um, uh, uh, written out. It's it's really hard to operationalize. Anything that comes down to you know it when you see it, you know you're going to have a problem with. The issue here is that it, it, the, the focus completely goes onto the medium <laughs> and not onto the receiver of that medium, which is children. And without the emphasis on children and how can we better help children, then we need to kind of reevaluate where we're gonna, where we're gonna be. We have a really, really difficult time in our country, in our society, talking about sex. I mean, we can talk about it. We talk about, you know, nookie and getting it on. We talk about, you know, a thousand other synonyms for it that, that I missed last night's two and a half men, so I'm short on synonyms for having <laughs> sex. Um, and uh, uh, we do it on this really great at this one level, but it really inhibits us when we try to take it to a next level. And having worked in the public health arena and having worked around child advocacy, I would not dare to try to define indecency. What I would want to try to do is try to draw a better definition around positive sexual health behaviors that are age appropriate in the media, something that's not going to be destructive, but something that might actually be helpful. And we need to be able to figure a way that we can work both with the First Amendment community and with um, uh, aspiring legislators and po politicians that see the opportunity for using this, you know, grandstanding to their advantage, which I think largely the California video game case was for the most part, um, although uh, for um, uh, you know, it getting overturned, I think, actually did a lot of damage for us to being able to have the discussion of this issue. Um, we cannot talk about sex in the society with any sort of enlightenment, and so I wouldn't dare try to decide, try to define indecency. What I would try to t do is turn this conversation back to a healthier discussion about sexuality generally, so we can talk about health and then incorporate it into our children's world, because otherwise they're getting saturated with the absolute worst of it, and uh, and there's been no benefit from it, I think, in that regard. Well, um, uh, I, I know Adam's about to respond. I want to encourage you to come to the microphone and ask questions. If you don't come to the microphone and ask questions, we will keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> Very briefly, um, I like a, a lot of what Jeff had to say there. I think there are, you know, we do need to have more serious societal conversations about a lot of these issues, including sexuality. That's true. But I think there's still a question of, is there going to be a legal standard? Is there going to be legal, actionable uh, matters? And when Jeff says something like he doesn't want to legislate morality or define indecency, but he wants to restrict the heartless, well, I think we're right back to another standard that we have to define because, frankly, legislating morality and restricting the heartless sounds like a distinction without a difference to me. So, I mean, we have to, is that restrict the heartless in a legal sense? And what is heartless? And, you know, I, th these are hard questions, and it's an eye of the beholder problem that's very difficult for a free society that cherishes free speech. What I've said and what I think is in line with what Reno uh, says in the subsequent court case law is that these are matters that should be decided at a, a more household-based or individualized level. I mean, keep in mind, only 32% of households in America have children in them at any given time. So there's matters here that, that affect all speech for all adults as well as children. If you have one sweeping comprehensive standard from above, whether it's indecency or heartlessness or whatever else, somebody then decides for us what will even get to that home at the end of the day. I prefer to keep that control localized. I defer to the kind gentleman from uh, uh, <laughs> Jerry Mr. Berman. Berman. I, I, uh, Catherine, I was there, uh, uh, head of the Center for Democracy and Technology, and we filed that second lawsuit that was joined with yours. And we argued the least restrictive means test. Um, the, the, what I, two observations. One is, um, Robert Cannon's article is terrific in, the, in it. He points out the, that Section 230 was passed as part of that Communications Decency Act. It's all that's left. The statute was struck down, so that on the First Amendment grounds, and Section 230 is an integral part of that. The, I bring that up because the limited liability provisions 
were designed to, to deal with the least restrictive means test. Different communities, the, the theory was that, that parents would be able to go to a child safe prodigy, they'd have different adult content provided by an AOL, but that we would build on the least restrictive means test, common sense media. The real failure has been, we assumed that there would be a lot more third party marketplace driven solutions for kids because we're not going back uh, to the pre-CDA world. But that indecency and the role of government is not gonna work in this media and it's getting worse. One last comment, it's not, the broadcast section is about to go because the internet is becoming the paradigm for everything. And your kids are not on television, they're on mobile devices. They're on the internet, and I'm on the internet with, and bypassing cable. That's the paradigm. And so the, if we're going to solve the child safety problem, which I care a lot about, we have to worry about third-party solutions and marketplace solutions because the government's just not going to work in this area. Let me say two quick things. Uh, first of all, thank you for mentioning 47 U.S.C. 230, Section 230, Jerry. As you know, we have a breakout session this afternoon that I'll be moderating. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent job. <laughs> Excellent opportunity. I hope everybody here attends that um, so we can discuss that more fully. Um, but I was a bit surprised to hear you say, make your comment about uh, a potential lack of solutions. Uh, as you know, Jerry, until just recently, I compiled a book on parental controls and online child protection, a survey of tools and methods. It had, uh, I believe, eight different versions. I versioned it like software starting at 1.0 all the way to 4.2, and I finally gave up because of the sheer volume of tools, methods, controls, and child opportunities became overwhelming for me to classify. And as the parent of a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old, I have so many options I'm bombarded with in terms of child appropriate types of things, whether they are online or television, that my wife and I sit down and have to come up with a, a plan, an information diet in our household about, well, how do you get a serving of this and a serving of that? I, 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 th I think I'm looking at a has, uh, you know, you're looking at a glass uh, has uh, empty and I'm half full. There are lots of solutions, but the education level across the consumer base is, is that if you have to have a plan to figure out these tools, then the market has not worked the way it was thought it was going to work at the time of that lawsuit. There was the PIC standard as part of the CDA, which was... So you're the, saying there's not simple solutions? There's not that, simple, they're, and, that they're layered and, and complex? And they're layered and complex, but they require uh, the, the, the private sector to drive those So this trade-off, this is a fair point. Uh, I've written quite a bit about this, and, and Bob will tell you my 160-page comment to the FCC and the Child Safe Viewing Act. <laughs> Spent a lot of time focusing on this trade-off between complexity and convenience in the field of parental controls, online safety, and privacy. This is a tension that has always been with us and will always be with us. And my approach is, my, what I favor, is the let a thousand flowers bloom approach. <coughs> yes, it will be complicated. There are a lot of options. I don't want a one-size-fits-all solution, either from government or industry. That's why I have problems even with the VCHIP being more privately administered. I still think it's problematic that we don't have more and different types of rating solutions for television or controls there. But keep in mind, the government sort of pushed that process along and mandated that. They, let, they took off the controls on the internet. We've got dozens of filtering solutions, dozens of screening solutions, dozens of monitoring solutions. I can't even itemize them all anymore. I think that approach is better than the one size fits all. Anybody else want to respond to me? Next. I was glad to cede my uh, position to Jerry. I'm Gary Arlen from Arlen Communications. And it's a little bit what you're just talking about, Adam. The, although we're here to talk about a reflection of the past 15 years, we're much more interested in what's going to happen next. I first heard the term lap surfing, and it sounded filthy, but it was the idea of putting kids on mom or dad's lap and learn how to use the computer at age three or four. And now we've got a generation that's grown up. They're almost the age, Catherine, that you were when the, this uh, the policy went through, program went through, but now we've got digital natives who are into sexting to all the other services that really aren't media services, but they are part of the digital environment. And what lessons can we learn from what we've had so far going forward to the new environment of user-generated content? Um, I'm, I'm with you that TV is still a very popular medium, but depending how you look at it, as Jerry said, the future is not in linear, straight uh, uh, broadcast or cable television. We're talking about a whole new environment. How are the lessons of the past going to be used as we go forward into this new digital environment with kids and others? Anyone else? 
to want to step up? Oh, sure. I, I'd, I'd say a couple of different things. One is that, uh, you know, the, I, I think the, uh, the rumors of the demise of television have been a little bit exaggerated. Uh, you know, what, uh, what we do see and what the, the data bears out is that particularly children tend to use multiple media platforms at the same time. You know, while they're sexting, they're watching Two and a Half Men. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, so, uh, you know, so that's additionally problematic in terms of, uh, of, of uh, what the parental controls are. But the, uh, you know, the, I, I agree completely with that. I mean, I w frankly, I wish in his 135-page uh, brilliantly 160. worded, 160-page <laughs> brilliantly worded uh, comments to the FCC, he would have made a better point of saying that uh, particularly as it deals with television, uh, the, the parental controls that we have are a one-size-fits-all, um, uh, not government-mandated, but government-encouraged, but entirely industry-regulated uh, and industry-controlled uh, situation. So if you're a uh, captain parent and do exactly what uh, the, the entertainment industry would have you do, and that's use your V-chip and parental controls, et cetera, you're still uh, held hostage, if you will, to the rating assigned to that content by the same people who produced the content in the first place. And as such, we would argue that they have an economic disincentive to rate their programs accurately. And dozens and dozens of, uh, of looks at this have said, well, the, the ratings are simply wrong a great portion of the time. Our data says that roughly two-thirds of the time uh, the ratings are simply inaccurate in one way or the other. Uh, so, so that's obviously an enormous problem. To your, to your second point about uh, you know, what, what do things look like in 15 years? You know, it's anybody's guess. I'm not sure anybody would, would think that we would, we would have kids sexting while watching Two and a Half Men 15 years ago. Uh, but that's, that's exactly where we are. Uh, I'm, I'm 38, so I'm a little bit, uh, little bit too old uh, to be a, a digital native. Uh, but I, I look at my nieces and nephews, and we, we literally have the first generation of kids who have grown up in this 24-7 media-saturated environment. Uh, you know, it simply hasn't existed before. And, um, you know, there, there's sort of two schools of thought. Uh, you know, it, it may interest, you know, you guys to know that I'm, I'm not the, the greatest fan of broadcast decency rules as they're written. Uh, I don't think that, uh, that they've been, uh, I certainly don't think that they've been uh, adequately enforced over the years. But, but be that as it may, they at least have, and I think uh, Justice Alito alluded to this last Tuesday, uh, or excuse me, Justice Kennedy referred to this last Tuesday, is that if nothing else, they have a symbolic importance to say that in the public sphere, you know, some things are okay and some things are simply inappropriate and we're not going to stand for it unless you want to do it after the kids go to bed. I mean, that's, that's what Pacifica said, essentially. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm not as pessimistic uh, about the, the future of television in general and broadcast in particular because it is ubiquitous, uh, because it is everywhere, because it the penetration rate for, for broadcast television now is even greater than it was at the time of Pacifica. So um, I, I do think that there are legitimate problems here, but, uh, but if, at least from where I sit, if we know where the kids' eyeballs are, we can at least deal with the greatest uh, portion of the problem to begin with, uh, and, then, and then sort of filter out into these other things. That's a big part of the reason why my organization hasn't changed its name. Uh, from the Parents Television Council to something else, to the Parents Media Council or something like that. Because the biggest, uh, you know, the literally the 800-pound gorilla in this discussion is television uh, and the impact that it has. I have a, a brief comment on what Gary uh, asked about uh, the what's next, uh, because I think it ties back into something else he said. He said made a concern about sort of sexting and things like that. I think this is an important aftermath of Reno that we missed, which is that we were so focused on the content side, we didn't think about the con the, the uh, con uh, contact and the communication side of it, and the uh, behavior side of it. And this has become a serious problem online. Uh, we know this with not just things like sexting, but obviously cyberbullying. And it shouldn't have been a newsflash to any of us. Guess what? Kids are mean to each other. It's been happening since the dawn of uh, civilization. But it is a problem. And there's a lot of groups in this room that contribute uh, uh, mightily to trying to help solve that. I see Stephen Balcom here from FOSI. Common Sense Media is here. Cable in the classroom. A lot of people have digital, digital citizenship approaches to this, which I think are quite wise. Um, trying to instill good uh, values and sort of netiquette in uh, youngsters to address these things. Again, these weren't really the focus of Reno um, or the, the sort of porn obsession of the, of the 90s, but this is clearly the problem of the day that I think we should be discussing more. What's next? Well, I think the reason why digital citizenship and education is so important is because we're going to face a world of fully immersive uh, virtual holography and uh, VR environments. 
where we're going to walk home. And I know I'm going to walk home in six years, and my teenage son is going to be there in the living room, either sort of doing some sort of uh, Grand Theft Auto 14, where he's strangling somebody, <laughs> and uh, maybe he's, you know, banging a porn star virtually. I don't know. I mean, I need to have a conversation with him about what's appropriate and what isn't. I, I, some of Jeff's friends in the psychological community are going to be pulling their hair out, you know, and they hear about this because this takes media effects theory to a whole other level because it's visceral. And that's the world that's going to be upon us another decade, I believe. What's the legislative arrangement for it? Uh, on that issue or just no, generally? Just that well, I think it's quite limited because not just of Reno, but because of the post-Reno decisions, such as this, uh, the COPA dis uh, decisions, the, uh, the Playboy decision, the Brown decision most recently with video games. What you're seeing is one First Amendment slam dunk after another. And whether you like that or not, that's the reality. Reno established that new jurisprudential baseline. That's why, to me, fighting over these things in a legislative or regulatory way is kind of silly. We need to move on. We need the better approaches, education, empowerment, digital citizenship. Yeah, it, go ahead. I would offer that I think one of the concerns that we have, the answer is what, the, what does the legislative you know, outlook uh, for this? And it's, it's what we have experienced in hindsight. It's baby steps. We're going to take one step forward and we're going to take sometimes one step back or we'll take two steps back and two steps forward. That we are still trying to kind of struggle with this issue, this, this, this metaphysical creation called the internet that we have no idea how to deal with it. Um, we barely have, you know, ideas on how to deal with television and our children. When we deal with something much more technologically uh, uh, complex, it creates a whole host of new issues. Um, to Adam's uh, point about, you know, where we were, you know, uh, 15 years ago and where we will be in 15 years, pretty much everything that we have discussed right now is temporary. This is all fleeting technology. You know, um, uh, uh, how long did it take Facebook to become, you know, a prominent media place? How long did it take Google to become kind of prominent in our media culture? In fi 10, 15 years, this may be a completely different conversation. The two things that I think are going to be interesting about this is, um, number one, the thing that will not change are children. And their needs are going to be constant, and their needs are going to be the same. And so we're still going to try to struggle to address this. I think the only other constant in this is change itself. Um, the concern that I have, <clears throat> certainly in these panels where we emphasize kind of the, the, the judicial overturn on so many of the First Amendment uh, 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 challenges that have happened, um, but at the same point, one of the things that we have concern about in the children's advocacy arena and the public health community is what are the implications down the line for this? Yeah, CDA gets overturned. We can, we can build on what we've learned there, both from a First Amendment standpoint and from a children's standpoint. But what does that mean if Pacifica gets overturned, potentially? As the industry made the case in their amicus at the Fox uh, uh, Supreme Court case uh, uh, last week, um, this isn't just about overturning the fines. This is about taking a look at the Brown case uh, with entertainment merchants and really going after the ability to regulate content in any way, um, especially um, if it's geared towards children. Now, this has really severe repercussions uh, from our community for things like the Children's Television Act and for public interest obligations that protect children, that provide for educational programming for children and that allow for protections around advertising, um, uh, host selling, those sort of things. Um, and so why I do see these challenges happening kind of on these more macro levels and getting knocked down, um, it's not for the lack of the issue being valid. It's because we haven't found that narrowly targeted sort of uh, way to be able to approach it. And the places that we have found a narrowly targeted way to approach it, like the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, really focusing on privacy concerns, we've been successful at defending that. And so when we take a look at the legislative outlook, that's what we're doing is we're, we're trying to more narrowly define you know, uh, how we can approach this sort of issue. Um, uh, you know, if the government doesn't step in, kind of regardless of where the technology goes, if the government doesn't allow for child advocates and public health communities, kind of regardless of where the future is in 15 years technologically, if we can still not rely on our representatives as opposed to a board of stockholders to protect the most vulnerable populations in the worst case scenarios, then government has failed in its most basic job. Um, yeah, we have a right to speech that's defended in the Constitution, but we the people are the ones that we have to stick together to be able to protect the most vulnerable in the worst case uh, uh, scenarios. And, and nine times out of 10, that's gonna be children. Yeah. 
what, one of these days I'm going to learn not to let Jeff speak first. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd, I'd add just very quickly that, uh, you know, the, the focus on a panel like this is always going to be on the government solution to things. Uh, I would say that uh, in an environment where, uh, you know, if, if everything has to survive strict scrutiny, uh, that, uh, that the industry itself has a much bigger role to play than it's currently playing. Real uh, quick. Baron Soker from Tech Freedom, obviously worked with uh, Adam here for a long time, so uh, he and I tend to be on the same page about these things. I, I want to ask a general question, and then I want to follow up specifically, Jeff, with you about, uh, about Pacifica. So in general, the question was, uh, it seems to me that to talk about Reno in isolation is, is difficult because uh, it's really in Playboy that the Supreme Court takes that next step. I, I view those as, as two interlocking cases, and it's in uh, it's in Reno that the court says that, uh, that the, as Adam put it earlier, that the internet is born free. And then in Playboy in 2000, the court comes along and says, well, even in the context of cable, we're going to prefer um, a situation where if parents have the ability, in that case it was one that's granted by statute, to, to opt out of having um, uh, a, adult content sent to their cable system, that that's a, less, a superior, less restrictive mean to an opt-in mandate. So my general question is, um, the court is, in my view, has been on a trajectory from that case onwards towards fulfilling what Justice Kennedy said there, which was that technology expands our capacity to choose and that it denies the potential of the digital revolution if we presume the government is best positioned to make those choices for us. And if you hold that up in, in contraposition to, um, to Pacifica, those are two radically different ways of looking at the world. Because in 1978, the court said that parents were, were powerless. They had no ability to, to choose or to control what came into their homes and that um, cable, if anything, was an intruder in the home and that's why it had no First Amendment protection. So my first question is in general, what, what basis is there for continuing to apply Pacifica uh, at all to, to broadcasting given where the court ha has been heading, uh, given that we, we have changed so dramatically uh, both the, the empowerment, the, the key aspect, I think, of Pacifica, that parents can choose today, whether or not it's perfect. The court already said in Playboy that, that it's no response, that, that those, those user empowerment tools may not be perfect, that, that they require some effort from the user, that they're still superior to uh, regulation. And then, Jeff, to your question, uh, you, you seem to be suggesting that um, we shouldn't overturn Pacifica because there are other regulations that that, the, that you like, that the government wouldn't be able to impose, that Pacifica would overturn it. I'm not sure I mm. see that that's actually the case, because it seems to me that Pacifica really is about, again, protecting people from, from a certain kind of content that they were not able in the 1970s to protect themselves from. And you could at least say that that has changed, and that, that, that we can no longer say that that's the case, and we can no longer deny broadcasters First Amendment rights in that respect. But maybe on some other grounds, still hold out some room for the kinds of, of um, uh, public interest duties that, that you would see. So I'm not sure why you think those two things are related. Um, and let me just note we're right at the end, so please do answer, but also keep in mind that we're, we're closing. I'll do this as my best auctioneer impression as I can to do this. No, no, answer um, fully. Just know that much is in front of us. <laughs> Even more so. Um, uh, it, it, that's a valid point, I think. I think one of the concerns is, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that we haven't seen necessarily is how an overturning of Pacific and Red Lion would potentially play out. Um, one, of the, one of the things that has happened is that we have switched over the public interest obligations, for instance, from analog to digital. And in doing so, we uh, created a great amount of protections for children uh, on uh, television and even laid the groundwork for extending the FCC's authority into the internet with that decision. Uh, and that's on a wholesaling uh, rule that was integrated into the public interest obligations for children's digital media. And so would Pacifica interfere with the digital media, you know, public interest obligations? Oh, yeah, I think that's uh, possibly debatable. I think it establishes a dangerous precedent, certainly, for tearing down the Children's Television Act. And uh, whether that would be a bad thing or a good thing, I think that's also something that we have a lot of debate about uh, as well. So. Well, I'd like to hear what Oh, now you bring that up. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I would say specifically to, uh, to Pacifica, uh, you know, the only thing that was before the court last week was whether or not broadcasters who have a license from the federal government uh, to use the publicly held airwaves uh, in a manner that's consistent with the public interest have the ability, or, or I should say the legal right, 
uh, to air uh, in unlimited and decent content at any time of day, no matter who is in the audience. Uh, the, the question not before the court was whether or not indecency was bad or indecency was bad after 10 o'clock or anything like that. The only thing that was before the court was if we're going to be okay as a society with the F-bomb on the, on the broadcast airwaves at 8 o'clock when your kids are home from school. And that's, the, that's the only thing at issue. Uh, it's been clouded in an awful lot of different things. Uh, but that was the very issue before the court. Um, you know, I, I don't know how that case is going to turn out. We'll find out between now and the second week of June. Uh, but, but I do know uh, that, that these things are important. You know, millions of parents and families rely on them every day uh, when they're not sitting in conference rooms in Washington, D.C. debating about strict scrutiny. I mean, these things have real impact for real people millions of times every day. Uh, I, I don't see this as any sort of free speech issue. I don't see it as a, as a gross intrusion on the free speech rights of broadcasters because they can air such content to their heart's content uh, after 10 o'clock or before 6 in the morning. Uh, that they don't choose to, in many cases, is their issue. Uh, but they do have at least the legal ability to do it. Uh, all this is is a time, place, manner approach, which is consistent uh, with lots of other time, place, manner approaches that we have on lots of other things. Let's just be clear that no matter what happens with television, it's outside the realm of what Reno has established for almost everything else in our modern information ecosystem. So even if we have a sort of safe harboring approach, a meta-safe harbor approach to broadcasting, it's very unlikely it will spread beyond that. It's a point that I make in my new Forbes Weekly column. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's available right down here if you'd like it. Can I make one last point, which is Try and imagine what would have happened if Reno had gone the other way. If there was time, place, and manner, and an and indecency standard applied to the internet, it would not be possible, in my mind, to get to Facebook. It would not be able to get to Twitter. It would not be able to get to Google. Those would be crippled applications. The internet, as we know, there would be an Arab spring. It would have been, it would have been a real blow to the internet. And so that has to be weighed in any of uh, uh, weighing and balancing of, of, you know, government intrusion in this area. In um, all due respect to your great career and legacy, Jerry, that's a hypothetical that I think it's hard for us to go back and try to be forced to defend of what would not have happened. Um, and uh, at the same time, be able to defend the greatness of the marketplace to be able to respond to situations and work around stuff. I think if there's any concern that we have here, and I think it's the concerns that we have around CIPA, it's a, the concerns we have around a lot of the other non-Reno legislation that we're talking today, is that there is a move towards a great uh, homogenization of the media that's out there. Technology may provide a lot of individual sort of uh, 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 answers and the ability to be able to respond in different ways and a lot of individual tools, but the trend has been much more towards uh, homogenization of AT and you know NBC and Comcast are suddenly together. AT and T and T-Mobile we're trying to get together. That we have these big entities that are trying to get together that control a lot of these mediums, and so we're very concerned as well, legitimately, over things like CIPA, I think, and copyright <coughs> as well, because it also has implications. That this is the it's a free speech issue because media ownership is going to be a free speech issue. Do I t trust establishing a foundation with a government with my representatives? Yeah, I can understand why people would be scared by that. If you watched the primary debate last night, you're probably scared <laughs> by that. Um, but on the other hand, um, I'm also scared by the, the prospect of leaving that up to a board of stockholders and, the, and market fluctuations. Any other very quick last remarks? I'd rather leave those decisions up to families and individuals in general as opposed to government or corporations. But at the end of the day, it's the government who has the most important sensorial powers over our speech in this country, not corporations. All right. Uh, speaking of hypotheticals, I think one thing that may not be hypothetical is uh, the importance of Section 230, which is the subject of the next panel. Uh, that one was, the, of course, the, the provision that says uh, hosts and online services are not liable for third-party content intermediaries. Um, 
With that, we will go to lunch. Thank you very much. This has been a very excellent panel. I, I learn something every time. I know moderators say that every time, but uh, I really do. And it, putting my government official hat on, I will say that when people come to the agencies and talk to us the way you guys just talk to us, it is tremendously beneficial, uh, and it does inform the debate. So thank you very much.